Welcome again, Your Honor. I have to say before I get into the uh, questions that I have for you um, that I, like many, many, many Americans, feel enormous pride that you are here today. And um, I was talking with uh, some friends in Providence when I was home about your nomination. And I said, uh, it actually gives me goosebumps to think about the path that has brought you here today, and more importantly to think about, because it's not about you, more important to think what that means about America, that path. And um, they said, no, 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 you can't say goosebumps. You have to say piel de gallina. <laughs> and so I promised them that I would, so I'm keeping that promise right now. But I want to tell you that I think uh, in the way you've handled yourself in this committee so far, you have done nothing but to vindicate and reinforce the pride that so many people feel in you. And I hope that as this process continues, I know these days are long and it can be a bit of an ordeal, I hope that you very much feel buoyed and sustained by that pride and that optimism and that confidence that people across this country feel for you and that so many people in this room feel for you. So uh, I wanted to say that. I also wanted to uh, fulfill another promise, which was the one I made to you, that in my opening statement I said I would ask you to make a simple pledge. And that simple pledge is that you will decide cases on the law and the facts before you, that you will respect the role of Congress as representatives of the American people, that you will not prejudge any case, but will listen to every party that comes before you, and that you will respect precedent and limit yourself to the issues that the court must decide. May I ask you to make that pledge? I can. That's the pledge I would take if I was, that I took as a district court judge, as a circuit court judge, and if I am honored to be confirmed by this body that I would take as a Supreme Court Justice. Yes. Thank you. Um, some of my colleagues have raised questions about your role at the uh, Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund uh, many years ago uh, before you left that organization to become a federal trial judge in 1992, I guess it was. Um, I just want to clarify, that was clearly a part of your history and your uh, package that came to the Senate uh, at the time of those confirmations when you were confirmed both in 1992 and 1997. So this is nothing new to the Senate, is that correct? That's correct. And um, in terms of the way that the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund operated, um, you were a member of the board, is that correct? I was. Did the attorneys for the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund uh, make it a practice to vet their legal filings with the board first? Did the board approve individual briefs and arguments that were made by attorneys in the, for the organization? No, because most of us on the board didn't have civil rights experience. I had actually, when I was a prosecutor in, in private practice, that wasn't my specialty of law. Even if they tried to show it to me, I don't know that I could have made a legal judgment, if you, even if I tried. Um, that was not our function. And we, I think that's customary in uh, charitable organizations for the board not to sign off specifically on briefs and other legal filings that the attorneys make. It's certainly in the years I've spent on the boards of charitable organizations, it's never been something presented to me. So I, I appreciate that. And um, in 1992 and in 1997, when the Senate was, again, fully aware of all that, was there, uh, to your recollection, any objection made in those confirmations? 
don't believe any question was asked about my service on the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, the fund is an organization that has and has been considered in the mainstream of civil rights organizations like the NAACP and the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. It promotes the civil rights of its community. Let me turn to some uh, more general questions, if I may. And one has to do with the role of the jury, uh, not just in trials. Obviously, you're eminently familiar with the role of juries in trials. I think you'll be the only member of the United States Supreme Court, if you are confirmed, who actually have had federal trial judge experience, which I think is a valuable uh, attribute. Um, but I'm not thinking so much about the role of the jury in the courtroom as I am about the role of the jury in the American system of government. When the Constitution was set up, as you know so well, the founders made great efforts to disaggregate power, to create checks and balances, um, and the matrix of separated powers that they created has served us very, very well. In the course of that, or as a part of that, the founders also revealed some very strongly felt concerns about the hazards of both unchecked power and of uh, the vulnerability of the legislative and executive branches to either corruption or to being consumed and overwhelmed by passing passions. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on the importance of the jury in that American system of government, uh, and if you could, with particular reference to the concerns of the founders about the vulnerabilities of the elected branches. Like you, I am, and perhaps because I was a state prosecutor and I have been a trial judge, and so I've had very extensive experience with jury trials in the American criminal law context. Um, I have had less in the civil law context as a private practitioner, um, but much more as a district court judge. I can understand why our founding fathers um, believed in the system of juries. Um, I have found in my experience with juries that virtually every juror I have ever dealt with um, after having experienced the process, came away hardened, more deeply committed to the fundamental importance of their role as citizens in that process. Every juror I ever dealt with um, showed great attention to what was going on, took their responsibilities very seriously. I had a juror who was in the middle of deliberations on her way to my courtroom, uh, I'm not on my way to my courtroom, on her way home from court uh, on the previous day, broke her leg, was in the hospital the entire night, came back the next morning on time in a wheelchair with a cast that went up to her hip. What a testament, both to that woman and to the importance of jury service to our citizens. Um, I was very active in ensuring that her service was recognized by our court. Um, it has a central role. Its importance to remember is that um, it hasn't been fully incorporated against the states. Many states limit jury trials in different ways. And so the question of 
of in what cases require a jury trial and what don't is still somewhat with, within the discretion of states. Um, but it is a very important part of a sense of protection for defendants accused in criminal cases, and one that I personally value from my experience with it. And does, do the, does the uh, founders' concern about the potential vulnerabilities or liabilities about the elected branch illuminate the importance of the jury system? Senator, I, I, as I see the jury system, um, I don't know exactly, I don't actually, and I've read the Federalist Papers and I've read other historical accounts, the jury system was, I thought the basic premise of it was to ensure that a person subject to criminal liability uh, would have a group of his or her peers pass judgment on whether that individual had violated the law or not. To the extent that the Constitution looked to the courts to determine whether a particular act was or was not constitutional, uh, it seems to me that that was a different function than what the jury was intended to serve. The jury, as I understood it, was to ensure that a person's guilt or innocence was determined by a group of peers. Um, to the extent that that has a limit on the elective branches, it's to ensure that um, someone is prosecuted under the law and that the law is applied to them. Um, in the way that the law is written and intended. And where the jury requirement applies to civil trials, the argument would be the same, correct? Yes. Um, again, on the question of the American system of government, um, how would you characterize the founders' view of uh, any exercises of unilateral or unchecked power by any of the three branches of government in the overall scheme? The Constitution, by its terms, sets forth the powers and limits of each branch of government. And so, to the extent that there are limits recognized in the Constitution, that is clearly what the Constitution intends. The um, Bill of Rights, the amendments set forth there, um, are often viewed as limits on government action. Um, and so it, it's a question always of looking at what the Constitution says and how, what kind of scope it gives for a government action at issue. Would you feel, in light of all of the uh, attention, very, very careful and thoroughly thought out attention that the Constitution gives to uh, establishing and enforcing a whole variety of different checks and balances among the different powers of government, that a judge who was presented with an argument that a particular branch of government uh, should exercise or have the authority to exercise unilateral, unchecked power in a particular area, uh, should approach that argument with a degree of heightened caution or attention? The best framework that has been set out on this question of a unilateral act by one branch or another, but usually it's a, the challenge is raised when the executive is doing something because the executive ex executes the law, yes. takes the action, typically. Um, the best description of how to approach those questions um, was, was done by Justice Jackson in his concurring opinion in the Youngstown's case. And that opinion laid out a framework that generally is applied to all questions of executive action, which is that you have to look at 
the powers of each branch together. You have to start with what has Congress said, express or implicitly. And if it's authorized to do something, to let the president do something, then the president's acting at the height of his powers. If Congress has implicitly prohibited, ex in expressly or implicitly prohibited something, then the president's acting at the lowest ebb of his powers. Um, there's a zone of twilight, which is the zone in between, which is has Congress said something or not said something. Um, in, in all of the situations, once you've looked at what Congress has done or not done, you then are directed to look at what uh, the president's powers may be under the Constitution minus whatever powers Congress has in that area. So the whole exercise is really in terms of Congress and the executive, an exercise of the two working together. And in fact, that's the basic structure of our system in, of government. That's why the Congress makes the law. The president can veto them, but he can't make them. Um, he can regulate if Congress gives him the authority to do so. Um, and within other delegated authorities, or, or, or I shouldn't use the word delegated because it has a legal meaning. But the point is that that question is always looked at in light of what Congress has said on the issue and in light of Congress's power as specified in the Constitution.